good afternoon or so. Um, it's a very great opportunity to be here and that you invited me, Markus, and to present what we are doing during the last couple of years at the University of Zurich because, as you heard, I, my career in inverted commas as a scientist started actually at the University of Konstanz. It was a much smaller place. It's a couple of months ago, but there were entirely only 1,200 students at the entire university, so a different thing. So what I would like to do today is to, to introduce you a little bit to our uh, approaches to understand the evolutionary significance of social interactions. And a short version of the talk would be conspecifics matter. We know that social behavior um, is, or social interactions are of major importance for each individual. They have a lot of uh, proximate effects also, but ultimately uh, they are adaptations to improve fitness. And this is why social interactions are extremely important. And it's a little bit more so, we know actually since a couple of years that the social environment is actually characterized by a very high degree of flexibility and intrinsic unpredictability. We, and not just only people coming from behavior, assume that the social environment is the most unpredictable part of the environment of an individual. And this is why we are so deeply interested in how do animals nevertheless coordinate, adjust their behavior to this constantly changing and unpredictable environment. And today, I don't want to cover all aspects that we are interested in, but I would like to emphasize two uh, studies or two, uh, let's say, approaches we take. One is a very old one. It's the puzzle of cooperation. And the other one is a more recent approach that we follow, that is to ask whether social behavior is modified through the immune system, so the dialogue, so to speak, between uh, immunology and behavior. And I'm well aware that I dare to actually here to present that in front of immunologists. I would like to emphasize I'm not an immunologist. We rather come from the behavioral side, so I would be very much interested in your comments. But starts with the first, the puzzle of cooperation. What's that? I mean, we observe in animals, uh, in bacteria, in invertebrates, invertebrates, very often, quite frequently, quite peculiar behaviors in which an individual does something, we call it cooperation or altruism, in which an individual shows a behavior to its own cost that has some kind of fitness costs, but is to the benefit of somebody else. And those uh, altruistic or cooperative behaviors have puzzled evolutionary biologists since 60 years, and we still try to understand how can we explain how animals stabilize cooperation despite the costs involved. And one quite peculiar example of cooperation is communal nursing in house mice. And this is actually something which I got interested in already when I was a postdoc reading the literature. Communal nursing has been described for lab mice. It has been described in the 1950s already that it occurs in free living, free ranging commensal house mice. It has been described in the lab, in the field. So, but nobody actually had asked why are the animals doing it? What is it? It simply means that two, sometimes even more than two females, pool litters in one nest, and then they indiscriminately, all females share then looking after the pups, and they indiscriminately nurse own and, non and the offspring of another female. And here that's a drawing from a, uh, from a photograph. Here you see a female nursing her two days old pups, they are naked, they can't hear yet, they're just uh, almost fresh, newly born. And at the same time, the pups of another female of the same social group, they are already 13 days old, their fur, the ears are open and the eyes will open. The next day they open the eyes with 14 days. And um, so it has been described, but uh, coming from, um, you know, basic training in sociobiology, you always wonder why do they nurse own offspring and simultaneously give milk to other offspring. And this is quite 
um, puzzling because when you look at the energetic costs of lactation, and we can do so by using actually a milking device. I first used it actually here at the University of Constance, um, but we still use it back at the University of Zurich. So we found out that the amount of milk a female produces to wean a litter of seven pups, they are weaned when they are, depends on litter size. 21 to 23 days old, she produces about 100 milliliter milk of a total energy equivalent of 1,100 kilojoule. To do so, they drastically increase food consumption, so she increases her daily energy intake by up to 200%, and we know that the amount of milk given to a pup determines its weaning weight. The more milk the pup gets, the heavier it is. But on the other hand, the more milk a female produces, the longer it takes until she can give birth to the next litter. There are costs, reproductive costs involved. And knowing that, it's quite puzzling. Why do they give this milk to non-offspring instead of preferentially nursing own offspring and increasing body weight of their offspring? So given that energy is very, or lactation is energetically very costly, the first thing we were at some stage then interested in, during communal nursing, do females invest equally in their joint litters? Because otherwise it's even more difficult to explain how they actually, how this kind of cooperation is stabilized. So a PhD student, a former PhD student, Manuela Ferrari, she milked or she analyzed milk production and the energy produced by communally nursing females. And what's plotted here is the milk produced during peak lactation, it's during day 13 to 16, shortly before weaning begins, of an individual female that's communally nursing with another partner in a lab study, but with actually wild caught house mice. So we work in the lab with um, the filial generation one to three of wild caught animals. And what's plotted here is what you can easily see that with increasing number of pups, total number of pups in the communal nest, an individual female increases milk production during peak lactation. And the more for the purpose of this talk, the most interesting aspect was there was no significant effect of own litter size. So actually what the females do is they cooperate during communal nursing. They share the investment into the joint litter, into the communal nest litter, so they invest according to the combined number of offspring in the nest. They actually cooperate. But there's a downside to that. And probably you might think about it, what, what's if they differ in litter size? Then trouble starts, isn't it? And this is actually the case. Given they invest according to the total number of offspring, we would predict that cooperating females will not benefit equally when they differ in litter size. They invest equally, but the benefit will differ on their contribution to the communal nest. And we can illustrate that by looking at the energy invested per own offspring weaned when we look at communal nests in which females differed in litter size. Very rarely they exactly have the same litter size. Typically they differ in the number of offspring. So if we look, if we have in a communal letter, we have one female who has the larger litter, the other one the smaller, and we immediately see this will be the mean between the two females, and we see that the female with the smaller litter has a higher per capita investment per offspring than the one with the larger litter because they invest equally. And this is even more pronounced when we plot also the energy investment per capita, per head offspring of a female that raises her offspring solitarily. We see the critical point here is that the female with a smaller litter over invests during communally nursing to the benefit of the female with a larger litter. So there is a social dilemma in that situation. So females during communal nursing experience a social dilemma. 
this term of social dilemma, it's also called tragedy of the commons. Maybe you heard that term has been introduced by Hardy in many years in the last decade, so in the end of the 60s. And Tardin uh, described with that term economic problem that arises when individuals try to maximize their own benefit in a situation where they have shared access to a resource. So, and he concluded since the individual benefit will result in costs when you use a shared resource, like a commons, that's where the term comes from, or a public good situation. So the benefit of the individual gets results in costs that are shared by the entire group. And he predicted in these situation, cooperation is not, cannot be stabilized, cooperation will break down. And that's exactly what we have in the situation of these communally nursing females. They share the investment, they, are they invest equally, but they differ in the outcome, in the benefit, and that's exactly this situation of a social dilemma, and we would predict they shouldn't do it, but they do it. Uh, maybe just as a comment, these situations of a social dilemma or public good, probably all, are, many of you are aware of that, are very well studied in us humans, but we do have very few examples from animals where we can do better experiments, a little bit more, maybe different kind of experiments, and we so far have very little uh, understanding about that. So when in um, so the point now was uh, if females uh, risk being exploited by a partner when they have the smaller litter in a communal nest because then actually they invest to the benefit of the partner with the larger litter. So if they risk being exploited under specific uh, situations, we expect that they adjust their cooperation. This was a prediction that we would say if natural selection works on that, otherwise we cannot explain why this behavior occurs. We expect that they adjust their cooperativeness according to the expected outcome, to the degree of, let's say, uh, social dilemma in a situation. So uh, Manuela Ferrari used a genetic tool to manipulate, we tried to do an experiment to that question, and what we needed is to manipulate litter size in utero. Knowing about the communal nursing situation, it doesn't make sense to manipulate litter sizes after birth. You can do a lot of cross-fostering, but then you notice this wouldn't help us. So we needed something where we could manipulate a litter size in utero. We use a genetic tool. I don't want to go into details here, but maybe there are some insiders. We use a genetically occurring selfish genetic element. It's the T. haplotype of house mice. We can talk about that later. But it allows us to create social groups in which we have full sisters. These are full sisters raised together, and either they will produce equal litter sizes, this is our control group, or they will produce litter sizes that differ drastically, about by almost 50% in size. So our experimental group then was a social group with sisters, so we wanted to have the same background also in terms of familiarity with each other and everything, but they differ in litter size. And then um, we did a couple of experiments, and what I would like to show you here is that females actually adjusted their cooperativeness according to the situation. So they had a significantly lower or reduced propensity to cooperate when the females differed in litter size, when there was an asymmetry in litter size, in the situation where litter sizes were equal, they almost always to almost 100% cooperated, but in the other situation of the asymmetry in, in, in litter size, they only uh, reduced, they drastically, significantly reduced their uh, propensity to cooperate. So this means that cooperation in the presence of this risk of exploitation 
um, can be facilitated by symmetry in investment. So as long as females are similar in litter size, have similar litter, uh, uh, similarly sized litters, we can, we see that obviously cooperation is facilitated. If that is correct, we next would predict again or expect that females are choosy with whom they will cooperate. We would predict that they adjust their behavior according to the social partners available or that there is something like selective partner choice as a mechanism to stabilize cooperation. So do females choose social partners. We're not talking about mating partners, but here we are talking about social partners. So we are still in the lab, and we then went from mice kept in cages to um, some kind of a semi-natural situation in enclosures where we had six nest boxes, food and water available. This was before the mice were released. It all looks very tidy and clean. But then we released in each enclosure six previously unfamiliar, unrelated females. They never had seen each other before, and, but they were sexually mature and they can do whatever they wanted in these enclosures. To make a long story short, the data revealed that the females were choosy. Females in such a situation establish individual preferences. And these are actually individualized preferences. It's not that one female is attracted for everybody else, but you can have among these six females, you can have several individualized uh, social bonds. You can call it in inverted commas, friendships. And they establish something like a significant positive associations to one specific uh, group member. Andrea White, another PhD student, she went a step further. She did a follow-up experiment. And from each enclosure, she allowed two females that had established such a social bond, a positive relationship, to start breeding together in a social group with, an, with a male, I mean, unfamiliar male, and so on. So on the one hand side, she allowed two females that, had, that were preferred partners. And she took from the same enclosure two females that did not establish a social preference to each other. We call them non-preferred partners. It's important to notice it's not that these females avoided each other. They just met as you would randomly expect in a group of six females. So it's not that they avoided each other, but they didn't establish a social preference to each other. And when we then looked for their what we call lifetime reproductive success under, you know, in, under laboratory conditions. It's a life expectancy of half a year, uh, which to our understanding at that time seemed to be reasonable, and we now know it is quite reasonable. We saw that a female that's allowed to share a social group with a preferred partner has a significantly higher lifetime reproductive success. So um, this means choice matters. They choose and choice matters. Choosing a social partner results in fitness consequences. So we can add to our list that um, there is something like social partner choice and choice has fitness consequences which can help us to understand why are they uh, actually communally nursing. So these lab data, um, gave us a feeling uh, communal nursing has fitness consequences. By choosing the proper partner, they can improve their fitness, their fitness benefits. Um, why do they nurse solitarily? Why do they still nurse, I mean, which has been reported, why do they, they breed solitarily? And our idea had been maybe if, the, if not the proper partner is available, maybe this is why they nurse solitarily. And we thought, to be honest, um, it would be nice then to look at these aspects under natural conditions. When we do not modify the social environment where my, mice are free to do the house mice whatever they want. And this is um, actually, as these things go, it's always overlapping these things, but why I 
thought a couple of years ago we should study a free living population. And since 2003, we study a free living population of house mice, population of commensal house mice in what we call the barn. It's an agricultural building at the outside of Zurich, a little bit outside. It's a long story. It was not so easy to find a place where the surrounding people are tolerant of house mice. This was the biggest problem, to be honest, which I can understand. Um, in that building, we now have a, a lovely population of house mice, and the mice frequently interact with conspecifics. They interact during resting or sleeping. They interact during exploring the surroundings. They interact, they're looking for mating partners, of course, and social partners, and also they interact uh, during feeding. Just a comment, house mice do not defend food sources, so you can have 15 animals feeding at the same time. So this is just a little bit to keep in mind. Um, the situation or the, the barn uh, is structured by these uh, plastic walls, but uh, you sometimes can see it. There are holes in it. The mice can go wherever they want. Uh, the structuring helps to have more different social groups. Uh, we provide the wild mice with food and water. The food is natural. House mice are where the food is. It's nothing unnatural. And most importantly, we provide them with these nest boxes, which the females specifically like to rear litters. And the other important aspect that's illustrated here, it's an open system, so to speak. There are lots of holes on, and uh, um, open places under the roof where the mice can leave the building. We get emigration and very, very occasional immigration even into that system. The nest boxes are important for us because we can open them. So we provide the mice also with straw and hay so that they can build very nice nests. So we can open the nest boxes. And what we do, we regularly search for new litters. We estimate their age. And when they are 13 days old, this is shortly before weaning starts, it's the oldest age we can handle them and being sure that they have not yet moved between nest boxes. We go back and we take specific measurements. We also take a little a tissue sample from the ears for genetic analysis. And so this helps us to track actually uh, litters that are recruited in the population or offspring dispersed. And additionally, we have mouse detectors um, at the nest boxes. So each the tunnel or the tube through which the mice enter or leave the nest boxes have two antennas and the mice carry little RFID tags, these transponders. In Switzerland, all dogs must have that. And cats increasingly also get it's actually the same system. And individuals that walk through these antennas then are recorded by the system. So this system allows us to track the movement of mice in and out of nest boxes. And the system works. At the moment, it works very nicely. We have seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We record who is entering which nest box and spends how much time with whom in the same nest box. It actually helps us. This was a pregnant female, as you probably have seen. It helps us to track social interactions. When I talk now about social interactions, they only refer to the situation in nest boxes. We do not yet track. We have a couple of people working at that at the moment, what they're doing outside. But mainly, I'm talking here about the who's meeting whom in which nest box, which is an important information about social information. This slide always reminds me to just tell you that we have pedigree information that are here are the uh, males are yellow, the females red from the very beginning of our study. We have pedigree information since the beginning of the entire population. Basically, we follow individuals from cradle to grave, as we say, or until they leave the barn. And just a little bit maybe background on house mice, because I think it's not always know the, the commensal or the feral housewives are polygyn endress. So males mate with several females, which is no surprise, but females mate with several males during a single estrous cycle. The maximum we ever got in terms of genetic 
uh, multiple paternity is four fathers for a litter of seven offspring. And that's certainly a conservative measure because not each mating will result in paternity. But I know this is quite a difference to the lab mice, but I think the lab mice, it's a result of artificial human selection over generations and generations. But now I would like to summarize a little bit the social environment for a female. They live in rather complex social environments. They live in social groups with several female partners. And on the right-hand side here, you see a cartoon of a social network. Different colors are different social groups. And what you see here, for those of you who are familiar with social networks, that each female uses not only one nest box, but several nest boxes and overlaps and shares in these nest boxes with some other females. And they are socially very, I think, strongly isolated from other social groups, at least inside the nest boxes. You see that we get these very nice social groups and they consist of up to 12, 14 different females. Females compete over reproduction quite drastically. 50%, that's a summary slide of, kind of, kind of, I think, eight years or so. 500 females that were reproducing or that were sexually mature in the population that we could follow until they actually died in the barn. So we exactly know their lifetime reproductive success. And what you see that 50%, 249 in this case, did never wean any single pup. So there's a strong reproductive skew in the population. The skew looks exactly the same as among the males. The only difference is that uh, males, the best male we ever had sired 102 offspring, the best female we ever had, she sired 38 offspring. But otherwise, the skew looks exactly the same. Also, 50% of the males do not reproduce. Um, I won't go into more details, but I think this is also an, an I think, neglected uh, topic that is reproductive competition among females. It's as pronounced as it is among males, but they do it differently. They don't just bite each other and are so aggressive. They do it differently, mainly chemically. Um, also, what we know is that females share a social environment with related females. So they basically, the social groups in which they live, they share it with relatives, not exclusively with relatives, but on average, if we look for something like a spatial genetic structure in the barn population, what's plotted here is actually the average degree of relatedness of a focal animal to somebody you meet in the same nest box, in the neighboring nest box, and so on, with increasing distance to the rest of the barn. And the blue line here would give you the random expectation, the genetic correlation between any two individuals over the entire population, and the black line is what we observe. So basically what it means is that females that often sit together in the same nest box have a rather high genetic correlation. What's plotted here is not Hamilton's R, the genetic degree of relatedness, but it's very close, actually. So we know that value here of 0.24 is equivalent to half sips, 0.25, so they share a social environment, even in the neighboring nest boxes. They are still related, but the further away spatially you go, it just is the spatial clustering among relatives that we observe in the population. And fortunately, they also cooperate in that population. 70 currently with rather high population density, 70% of the litters are raised communally, and we observe exactly that what we see in the lab. Um, another PhD student got interested in uh, how often do they have the opportunity to nurse communally and can solitary nursing be explained just by the fact that no partner is available? The first answer is this is not correct. We see solitary nursing even when females have the option available and even pro more pronounced so when we plot actually the random probability of joining another litter by plotting the proportion of nesting sites occupied, it's a little bit of a technical term, of having another litter available in the same group to which a mother could pool her own litter. 
and we then look at the probability to nest communally. This tripled line is the random expectation. If they just join another litter because it's there, the probability uh, of, or the null model of expectation, so to speak, what we observe is the red line. And to our surprise, we observe in the barn population that they significantly more often nurse solitarily than we would expect by the availability. They select actually against communal nursing. Females more, nurse more often solitarily than expected by chance. But if they nurse communally, whom do they prefer? And what I would like to raise your interest to is that they join, given the choice between several partners, they join the partner that's most familiar. So in other words, the more time a female did spend during the 30 days before she gives birth to a litter and decides to communally nurse a litter, the higher this kind of association to the partner is, the better can we predict that this partner will be joined. So basically what they do is they choose among those available the ones they know best, so to speak, in terms of association. And this fits very well to what we found in the lab, that the females establish social bonds, also in the barn. We have more information on that now, and that they join somebody with whom they already have a close association. But of course, now the most interesting part is what are the fitness consequences in this free living population of communal versus solitary nursing. And the first, and I'm not quite sure whether this is trivial or not, but I would like to mention it, communal versus solitary nursing are not fixed traits. So females within their lifespan, if they have more than at least two litters, they can use both reproductive tactics. So they can rear one litter solitarily in the next communal. That's, uh, I mean, of course, communal nursing might not be a fixed trait because you might not always have the opportunity to do so, but um, you generally can expect that maybe there is a strategy always nurse solitarily, but that's not what they are doing. So uh, Manuela Ferrari, she analyzed the long-term data set from the barn population. And the first thing what we find is that um, that's a result of model selection. It was quite a um, tedious statistical analysis, but I think it, she did a great job in that. So lifetime reproductive success increases with lifespan. Not terribly surprising, the longer you live as a house mouse, as a female house mouse, the more offspring you wean. But quite surprisingly for us, and quite, I first was a little bit, um, yeah, uh, struggled by that, is that uh, lifetime reproductive success decreased with the proportion of litters nursed communally. The more often a female nursed a litter communally, the lower was her lifetime reproductive success. This was a little bit surprising. So obviously in that free living population, in contrast to the lab studies, communal offspring care has fitness costs for uh, house mice. What are these fitness costs? To make a longer story short is pups raised in communal nests suffer from higher mortality. It's basically the result of female competition over reproduction. They kill each other offspring. It's female infanticide that's behind that phenomenon that they kill some of the other females' offspring. And these are costs of communal nursing. And this meant we had to turn our question entirely around. I mean, we started and thought we have to explain why they nurse solitarily. Now we were at the point why we had to conclude we have to explain why do they nurse communally if it has costs. Why do we still see it? Why? But please don't forget they more often nurse solitarily than uh, randomly expected. So they seem to be able to nurse solitarily even uh, with increasing density, even with uh, these opportunities available. And still they do. Why the hell uh, do they breed communally? And what uh, Manuela then uh, saw is that uh, with increasing age of the female, she decreased the problem, or she had a decreasing probability 
she nursed communally less often. So the older a female gets, the more often she rears litter solitarily. So older females, in other terms, uh, rear more litter solitarily than communally. With age, females also get heavier. So we have a clear trend. Actually, the females are ever growing. Very little, but they don't grow into guinea pigs. But nevertheless, body weight increases. So with increasing age, weight increases. And um, what it means is that obviously females with increasing age get heavier. We know that body weight is very important for social, for kind of dominance, uh, but for being competitive in a social group. And females with increasing age and body weight then have a higher probability to rear litters solitarily. So what it means is that communal and solitary nursing are two condition-dependent reproductive tactics. Young females, relatively small females, do communally nurse and they accept the costs of communal nursing. And our hypothesis at the moment is that they nevertheless increase the probability to breed at all. Otherwise, that's our expectation, which we are testing now, they would not be able to breed in that population. So this is why they accept the costs of communal nursing and um, do communally nurse uh, despite the costs involved. Um, I, I think it's for us, it, or specifically for me, this was quite an eye-opener because what what you can realize is very often in the lab, we just provide them with a social environment that's much too simple. That's, that doesn't include all these you know, age-dependent mortalities because basically what's behind that, these are life history models that are behind these data. And it shows in the lab we ignore any kind of uh, mortality differences dependent on the life history stage. And they are actually quite important concerning the outcome. We usually measure in the lab just the number of offspring weaned, but we see in a natural population this might look very different. So for me, this was quite an eye-opener. So what we've seen is that social interactions and the ability of females to coordinate their social behavior according to the situation available and even take costs to improve probably breeding success are critically important for an individual's uh, fitness. But if you open any textbooks in animal behavior, you know social interactions also have costs. Now I would like to briefly switch to the second uh, part of my talk is costs typically due to the exposure to contagious agents. Simply, you can catch diseases when you closely interact with your conspecifics. And uh, we know from many animal studies now that uh, the immune system can play an important, a critical role in modulating social behavior when animals are sick. Actually, the easiest way to modify social behavior is to make this individual sick. It's whatever you do or whatever, whether you work with interbrates or with, with vertebrates or so, if you make an individual sick, you get a pronounced effect on its social interactions, on its behavior. And uh, the fact that diseases modify behavior has been shown again, as I said, in invertebrates and invertebrates for many years. And the most striking thing is that the results you get when you sicken an individual, the modification in behavior, seems to be very much the same, independent whether you look at invertebrates or vertebrates. And this is why actually this set of behavioral modifications has been termed sickness behaviors. Sickness behaviors, if you work on ants, on, on whatever crustaceans or mice or birds, always results in a decrease in overall activity, in a reduction of food and water intake, and in a reduction of social and sexual interactions. And um, probably we know it when we are sick ourselves. We all, I think the symptoms are quite familiar to us. And probably as many of you here in the room are very well, well aware of, these symptoms are not induced by the, by the uh, disease, by the, whether it's bacterial or viral. They're response of the host. 
They are independent whether you have a bacterial infection or viral infection. They are actually induced by the host via cytokines. You know that much better than I know. These pro-inflammatory cytokines result or are speculated to be the reason for these behavioral modifications. But it's important to note that the host does it in communication with the immune system. It's not induced by the disease. And given that um, the population we work with, this was a free living population, we also thought whether actually the fact that diseases can hit any population or that some individuals uh, can be sick or diseased, whether there are adaptations in terms of the social behavior of the mice, that the inter interactions among the mice are modified by these, this syndrome of uh, sickness behaviors, which then, why do you do that? Probably to reduce uh, the spread of infections in the entire population. We had good reasons why we thought that uh, it will be interesting to look at that aspect in our population because we, in 2012, we wis witnessed a natural outbreak of a disease. We had a tularemia outbreak in that population, which also is, an, as I always say, quite an evening filling story experience for us also. It's a zoonosis caused by a bacterium by Francisella tularensis. It then we didn't do besides documenting and besides protecting ourselves, but otherwise we didn't interfere with the mice. It self-exhausted in three months, but it killed about one third of the adult population. It had a strong impact on the population. So we knew the population is probably from time to time exposed to natural diseases. So, of course, to study our interest in the communication of how the immune system modifies social behavior to result in adaptive responses, we didn't want to infect the population ourselves. Instead, we used this common model of bacterial infection, so the, with lipopolysaccharides uh, that are products of the bacterial surface, which you inject uh, into an individual and it elicits an immune response, so you immune challenge uh, your individual. It works again with many different organisms without actually causing them to, to carry a disease. And the nice thing is it's reversible. After 24 hours, the most, the, the um, symptoms will disappear and the, the animals are back to, so to speak, normal life without ever going through um, a real disease. We had first to do some laboratory experiments with our population of wild house mice just to make sure that they show these symptoms because uh, LPS never had been uh, tested before in wild house mice, in lab mice, there were studies. And I just summarized a couple of results. So the first thing is that um, we asked whether males that were immune challenged modify their behavior in a way that they were less attractive to females, and this is the case. So when, uh, first of all, they do show the sickness symptoms as described before, and when we inject sexually mature males with LPS, they uh, exhibit these symptoms, and then the second is females don't find them terribly attractive anymore. They prefer to spend more time close to healthy males. We also know that LPS injection, if somebody works on acoustic communication, modifies the uh, ultrasound communication in the mice. We also know it modifies the protein um, uh, expression, the gene expression in the liver that results in specific proteins that are very attractive for female house mice like darcin, but I don't want to go into this in more detail. So back to the free population, we uh, then specifically armed, uh, asked whether immune challenge mimicking an, exact, an infection affects social com connectivity has some kind of an effect how this free-ranging, free-living population is socially connected and whether this would have, it's not a real infection, would have consequences for disease transmission. And in quite a, I think, um, not an easy experiment to do, Patricia Lopez, who then was a postdoc in our group, she's now 
assistant professor in the States. So she was the leading person for a kind of staggered experimental design. Again, we have here a cartoon of the kind of the uh, social groups we had at the time when she did the experiment. Before I forget, this experiment was done during the non-breeding season, during January, end of December, beginning January, because we know that sickness uh, behaviors are influenced by hormones, by steroid hormones, and we didn't want to interfere here, at least with the female reproductive status. So what, why we started, we now proceed also during the breeding season. So uh, principle is that at a time, three to four groups were targeted, and one mouse per group rejected was rejected uh, with either LPS or control in one night. And then we followed the behavior, and over several weeks, we repeated actually this treatment. So all social groups had at some stage during the experiment one individual injected with LPS, another one with control, again, males and females. And uh, we only used one individual per time in a social group. So we had, in the end, we had a total of 35 control, 19 females and 16 males, and 37 immune challenged, 17 females and 20 males. And then we had our antenna system and we documented before the uh, manipulation and after the manipulation what they did in the nest boxes. And to make a longer story short, principally what the animals did is both females and males is, and this is why I do not plot these data here differently, because during the non-breeding season, there's literally, during that treatment, no difference. So um, the mice that were immune challenged reduced activity. What they did is they, the immune challenged ones are the gray dots, the controls are the black dots. So immune challenged mice reduce the number of entrances and exits into or out to nest boxes. They reduce drastically the number of nest boxes visited. They stayed in fewer or only in one nest box and they slightly decrease the time spent in nest boxes, which is a bit of a different thing, but nevertheless, we know that they got less active. So um, the other thing is that, uh, maybe before I show that slide, is our antenna system, since we have two antennas attached to each entrance tubes into the nest boxes, allows us to tell apart between mice entering, leaving, and also the sequence of mice already there, who's visiting whom, in other words. So we actually were able to analyze situations in which we knew and challenged and an LPS-injected mouse has been visited by another one or was visiting another one to learn about, are they avoided maybe? Do the conspecifics then realize they modified their behavior, we just avoid them? And uh, what we found actually is the opposite. We observed that those that were LPS injected reduced or had a reduced number of nest box partners they met, and this was to their own behavior. They actually, the degree, if you think in terms of social network analysis, the degree significantly went down, but this was not the case where in the control mice that got the saline injection, and this illustrated that these mice literally took themselves out of the uh, social networks. It's not that they were uh, avoided by the partners, and I will show or illustrate that here to you, just again a bit of a cartoon uh, situation where we have the social network before the injection, the night before the mice, one mouse was manipulated, and uh, the big uh, circles here are actually the mice injected with LPS and the following mice. And what you could see, you can see here, males are red, females are blue in that example, that this male here who had been LPS injected literally took himself out of the social network. The remainder of the network was virtually unchanged. So it's not that the others avoid this individual, but this individual went to a place where almost nobody came. 
So uh, this was quite an intriguing result, that this is not a result of the others avoiding, somehow notifying it, but they take themselves out. And now the question is, what's the consequence of this modified social behavior when you're sick, when you carry a disease? And then in collaboration with Per Block from the ETH uh, uh, at Zurich, we simulated, or mainly he did that, but we used the data we observe in the barn. So he used the network data, the actual, actually um, behavioral data from the barn. And then he simulated the spread of a disease in a population, first in a null model, which is that uh, upper purple line here with the stars, when no animal in the population modifies his or her behavior as we've seen before after catching a disease. So this, the null model says what in most disease models up to a few years ago actually was inherently assumed that the disease itself does not modify the behavior. It's, and you just then infect those whom you met the day before, before you got the disease. So then you see that the uh, disease will quickly spread to, uh, through not only the social group an animal is living in, but eventually also through the entire population. And then in a simulation model, um, we included more an increasing number of animals that modify their social uh, behavior as a function of the infection. So 10% will isolate themselves. Are these red, uh, what is this? Uh, things there, then we have the triangles, 20% isolation, 30%, 40% isola isolation. That's what we observe in our population. These were these extreme examples that I've shown before that they take themselves entirely out of the social network or actually 50% uh, and so on. And what we see is that with increasing percentage of the animals that modify their social behavior as a function of being infected as a result of the sickness behaviors, the disease can be contained in just some part of the population and will not spread into the entire population. So this is quite a drastic result here that the disease will die out, so to speak, within a rather short period of time, will not affect or hit the entire uh, population. So these conclusions so far show, show that such an immune challenge by mimicking an inflammatory challenge leads house mice to drop social ties to their group, drastically modify social behavior, and such localized changes of social connectivity impact on disease transmission, which is quite, um, I think, quite intriguing and important to keep in mind in these disease uh, models. So from this part, the take home message will be that behavioral changes induced by sickness can impact disease transmission. The moment we try to go a step further, because if all that um, holds true and we think there is an effect of it, it might actually raise the probably very challenging idea that also in non-sickens, in healthy individuals, there's constantly a dialogue going on between the immune system, the neural system, and the behavior, and that probably you constantly have a communication going on between your social behavior and your immune system. Finally, I would like to thank, of course, all who contributed to that study and funding that study, University of Zurich, uh, SNF, and so on. And specifically, I would like to, I always feel, the most important part were all these extremely uh, nice and clever helpers and collaborators who helped to contribute to this data. And thank you very much for listening.